All right, so now let's continue on our discussion from before, where we introduced Coulomb's law in its most general sense. And we're going to calculate the charge density, the charge distribution along a thin little wire of metal. So you imagine a tiny little cylinder here. It could be made of copper, say, or aluminum, and we've charged it to some scalar potential. So for example, suppose I just had a battery here, like so. You know, it has some voltage V naught, or you could write it as phi naught to be a little more uh, technical. You know, and there's some ground reference out here, and we've touched it like so. So what would happen in this situation? Well, you imagine there'll just be some current that flows here, which means a bunch of charge will collect across this thing. And what will happen is that charge will sort of repel itself, right? So you'll see a bunch of it kind of piling up along the edges a little bit with some of it on the middle. So I would like to know what is that distribution of charge around that uh, particular metal object. <clears throat> so how can we go about doing that? Well, one of the first clues is in an electrostatic uh, situation, we know that if we charge this thing to some uh, scalar potential, that, that that potential will be known and constant across the volume of this particular object, say. So we know exactly what phi is along the volume of this object. So that will satisfy our condition of, I need to know what phi of r is going to be. So we'll have phi of r. So this thing will be given. We'll have one over four pi epsilon naught. And then we'll have that volume integral, like so. Rho of r prime dv prime over r minus r prime, like so. So this will be known across the volume of this, but I now want to calculate this thing here. So how are we gonna go about doing that? All right, so the first step is we need to simplify the model a little bit. We could do a kind of a full three-dimensional analysis of this, uh, but for introductory purposes, it's gonna make a lot more sense to really break this down some. So one of our first assumptions we're gonna make is the thin wire assumption. And all that means is the radius is much, much, much smaller than the length. All right, so you imagine there is some diameter here and the radius is just, oop, sorry. And then you would say uh, the radius is just the diameter over two like that. So the distance from there to there is my A. So if it's thin, it just means it's very long and thin. And that's our thin wire approximation. Another thing we're going to do is we're going to assume that instead of having a sort of volumetric charge distribution, we're going to assume all the charge is squished into this tiny, tiny little thin uh, linear charge density along the X axis. Okay, so what that's gonna imply is I'm gonna write it like the following. Rho of R prime is equal to lambda of X prime times delta of Y delta of z prime, like so. So this is called a linear charge density, and it will have units of coulombs per meter, and then the delta functions each have one over meter, which is there inside their argument there. And so you notice I get coulombs per cubic meter. And this is handy to make this assumption because you see this triple integral over here is going to simplify into just a single integral. Okay, so let's write that out now. Okay, so this is what the integral simplifies into. So you notice this charge density over three integrals has been reduced to a linear charge density over a single integral like so. And this denominator here as well is going to simplify a bit. So we're going to write this out as the square root of x minus x prime squared plus y squared plus z squared like so. Okay, so I have an x-axis here, there's gonna be a y-axis like so, and there's even a z-axis that wants to come out here. So for simplicity, however, it's gonna make a lot of sense to just assume that z equals zero, okay? So, because there, there's no real reason to pick any particular orientation, and there's a symmetry if we spin this thing around. Uh, so we can just ignore the z-axis for now, that's okay. And then we get an expression like the following. Now we can also make one extra little assumption here, and that is we know what the scalar potential is along the surface of this object here. In particular, I could pick an observation point, say here, the point x comma a. So let, let's kind of clean that up now.
Okay, so I've redrawn my wire here, and I'm picking out a point here at a distance a away from the x-axis here. So I can do that because I know that phi of x comma a, like so, is equal to phi naught, right? So it might be like one volt or something. And it's gonna look sort of like the following, epsilon naught, integral from zero to L, lambda of x prime, dx prime, all over, and I'm gonna put in just simply an a here, plus a squared, like so, okay? This is now the equation we care about right here. You know, it's, it's a bit of an approximation because we cheated a little bit in our model. We basically pretended as if all of the charge were squished into the x-axis here, but then we also imposed the condition that the scalar potential is a constant on the outside of the cylinder. So really this should be kind of an approximation. It's a little flimsy, but that's okay because it will demonstrate the method of moments. It just is gonna hurt us a little bit in that we can't chop this thing up into infinitely thin wires forever uh, without introducing some error. But as long as our thin wire approximation is strong, that is we make it very long and very skinny, this approximation is gonna hold pretty well, and that's okay. So why is this expression here uh, useful? So this, expression is going to tell us a lot. It actually fits into a very special template. So let's just take a moment to step back and write that out now. Okay, so I've now rewritten our sort of Coulomb's law expression for that thin wire of charge. So I know that my scalar potential is a constant value for all values of x at a distant a away from the wire, provided I'm within the limits of the wire. If I go beyond, then the scalar potential will decay away. But on the wire, on the edges of it, this condition will hold. Now this expression is very, very special, and it fits a template that looks something kind of like this. Maybe let me say k of x comma t, g of t dt, kind of like that. This equation here, you notice, is very similar. This is kind of a generic representation of equations like this. And this is very, very special. It is called a Fred Holm equation of the first kind. I think you might even be able to say it's an inhomogeneous Fred Holm or something like that. But, oops, sorry. So this is, <laughs> I missed a step here, sorry. Fred Holm integral equation, I should say, of the first kind, like so. The idea, the idea being an integral equation. So we've, we've done a lot with differential equations. Now we're gonna look at this idea of an integral equation. And this is special now because this here is called the kernel. This is called the forcing function. And then this here is called the unknown, like so, okay? So we'll rewrite that kind of like that, okay? So anytime you see an equation that fits this template here, what should happen in the back of your head is a little voice should shout method of moments. So, okay, so we've dealt a lot with partial differential equations and you found that finite differencing worked very well. Now we have this sort of integral equation that we want to solve, where namely our unknown thing is buried inside of this integral expression here. So I know the stuff out here, I know what the kernel is and I want to dig this thing out. Anytime this little template comes to mind, you should shout method of moments as a method for calculating this unknown function. So let's introduce that in the next lesson.